the white Red Cross workers were angels of mercy. Well, yeah, that happened. I think I just started writing tentatively after a year of uh, not being able to care about poetry at all. And um, I think I'll end with um, some new little poems that are not trying too hard to be poems. They're not uh, villanelles. I don't know if you recognize things like that when you hear them, but I tend to, to write uh, in forms. Oh, no, I'm not gonna read these Augusta Savage ones. I'm gonna read these little poems, these little pandemic poems. This one is called Gulls at Mamagwin. At Mamagwin is the little one block long we, uh, town beach on the Long Island Sound in the town where I live. It's a beach that's one block long. And um, I just was out there one morning, a uh, snowy morning and uh, was just looking at the seagulls. So this is again, Gulls at Mamagwin. Some stand on one leg, some stand on both. Their footprints wave webbed flags on the snow. Somehow luck happens, they feed hunger. And this must happen day after day without a yawp about life's meaning. At dawn, the waves lapping forever, they stand among others of the flock on sand, snow, or on the shelter's roof. Or one leaps onto the solid wind. Some companionable screeps, some food, night, repeat, then a few feathers, bones. Moment by moment, reason for thanks. I duck walk about 20 paces, walk pigeon toed about 20 more, stop, look back on silly history. Then I read the plaques on the benches. The benches are all set up as memorials. These are really simple-minded little, little bitty poems. This is called Cloudless January Day. How wonderful to be alive. Just think about it. What a miracle simply to be here, taking everything for granted. It might have been different. Simply to be inhaling molecules, exhaled, inhaled, and so on for eons by every life on the planet. Atoms, once part of anyone I can think of. They pause briefly in me and then move on like a pulse of light from a dying star. I have only six of these little poems. Uh, this is called Nice Great Peace Place. We'd like to make the world a better place. We know that doing wrong is no one's right. We know the highest human goal is peace. A life is one leg of a relay race. You pass the baton of affirming light, hoping to make the world a better place. 
Paradise is bought with sacrifice. Simply being is cause to celebrate. Huzzah! The highest human goal is peace. All faiths aside, good works are blessed by grace. They bear fruit which holds sleep seed. Good works beget seekers to make the world a better place. For some, the neon stars of inner space are this way signs. Some, blinded by insight, don't know that the highest human goal is peace. The source of sainthood is just being nice. But good people want to be known as great. Our highest and most humane goal is peace. Our work is to make this world a better place. I'm going to read two more. This is called Last Mattress. This $1,795 slice of foam, I've decided, is the last mattress I'll buy myself. It's comfortable enough to die on. I'm accumulating nice nightgowns. As for the rest of it, well, there's chance. It's possible I won't die in bed. Maybe there will be a firing squad, a loose boulder on Annapurna, a runaway locomotive I have to stop, thereby saving hundreds. My last mattress. Hope it hosts good dreams. For my children's sake, may I ascend from it on a pink cloud at the end. And this is the last one I'll read. It's, uh, it's called The Punch Line. This may be interrupted by my cat. A few times in my life, I have awaked laughing out loud at a wonderful joke. I never recall the joke, but keep on laughing for a minute or two alone in the dark. A few nights ago, my friend Jack said something that laughed me awake, still laughing at Jack. Then laughing at laughing myself awake by laughing with no idea of what could have been so funny. I lay there smiling and musing, wondering if death is the punchline and life the joke or vice versa. Quack, quack. So that's my 20, uh, 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marilyn. And we will, we, we don't know exactly what happened with, with that technical glitch, but we are very sorry that that, that happened in the middle Five of the poem, which was a, such a powerful poem. Um, so let's, let's have um, some questions for you and JP from the audience. Um, there's a very vibrant chat going on, which we will save and send you also after the reading so you can see what all of your fans have written um, during the reading. But um, Sophia and I will, will ask some, you some of the questions that, we're, that we've been getting in. So um, for both of you, would you would you like to spend a little time talking about your process? Um, a lot of people were were writing right away when you said that for about a year, you um, didn't really care much about about writing poems. Um, if you would mind, um, if you wouldn't mind elaborating on that a little bit, and then talk about the process in general of 
of craft? Uh, easier for me to talk about craft. I mean, the, the other part was just my sense that I have nothing that I can say that changes anything for anyone, that we're just all here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean swimming like crazy and hoping, hoping that there is an island or a shore or something that we're swimming toward that I, that all I can do is dog paddle along with everybody else and that whatever poems I might be able to write are just useless. Mm -hmm. And then um, not too long ago, it just occurred to me that, that if I stopped thinking of what I might want to write as poems, that if I just think of them as jottings, as writings, as something, just little things, little sketches, something like that, like unpainted paintings, that it would be enough for me to to um, to take up the pen again and try to uh, to write something. So I started writing these little poems that are not ambitious. Uh, they're just little. Um, and um, the other part of it was about te technique. Maybe I should hand that over to JP um, because you write more than I do. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at you, JP, but of course you can't see that I'm looking at you. Um, uh, you wanna say something about technique? I think I probably she's trying to unmute herself. Let's, let's just, yep, that's mm -hmm. it. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't unmute. <laughs> um, well, I was first gonna talk a little bit about the process for me, just for me, the thing, especially now doing this, you know, during the pandemic was the group that I mentioned earlier, the almost heart circle. Um, so I think for me having that, having that group and it's just about eight of us, you know, and we literally will email a poem a day, certain months or other months we'll do a poem um, at least once a week, you know. So even whether it's good or whether it's bad, it's kind of like what Marilyn's talking about, just the idea of getting something out, you know. Um, and knowing that you have sort of this trusted, you know, small community that's going to, you know, accept it. And sometimes you get some really great stuff and sometimes it's like, okay, you know, <laughs> that's it. Um, so for me, I think that helped in terms of, you know, the process. Um, technique, um, I mean, I like, I like writing with certain forms. So for me, that's something that I, that I enjoy doing. And even in that, you know, in my group when I'm writing, it sort of gives me a chance to explore whether I'm doing like a gazelle, whether I'm doing the ethery, I like to do sometimes syllabic poems like the tanka or the ethery. Um, so that's something that also, I think when I have, when I'm using a form, especially if I'm dealing with a difficult topic as some of my, as some of my poems are, I think it helps me to kind of have that, everything in this, in this um, smaller structure or a stricter structure to kind of go, go in those deep topics. I was looking right. at some of the questions. Thank you. I tend uh, to, to write from historical research. So my technique starts with, with reading and gathering information and then deciding on a form and tr trying to figure out ways to fit the information into the form I've chosen. Um, so, yeah. That's, is there another question? Yes. Um, how do you decide on a form is one of the, of the questions we got for, for both of you. <laughs> Who's gonna do it? I know, right? How do you decide on the form? Um, I mean, sometimes for me, I literally would, will just, you know, choose the form, you know, especially if it's like an ethery or a tanka, which are the syllabic, the syllabic ones, you know. Um, other times, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if the, I think I feel like the form chooses me, you know, sometimes as well, um, especially when I'm thinking about the gazelles. Um, 
and I, I'll have a theme and I'll see that there's some kind of repetition. So for me, because there is, you know, some repetition in those, you know, the ending stanza uh, that will maybe draw me to that, to that form sometimes. Um, but usually I, I'll have something, something in mind in terms of the content and then maybe see whether it fits in, a, you know, fits in that particular form. Mm -hmm. What about you, Marilyn? I would say that's similar. I've never been able to write Guzzle. Uh, but I, I, right now I'm working on not writing an iambic pentameter because that comes very naturally to me. I like that and I like rhyme and um, I spent some time trying to devise new ways of rhyming so that the rhymes were less recognizable. Um, and I, I like just arbitrarily choosing a form and treating the material kind of like <laughs> the ugly stepsister's foot <laughs> ramming it into the glass slipper. Um, you that. the slipper and then you're gonna get you make this fit. I'm gonna yeah. make it fit. <laughs> um, and uh, and I really enjoy doing that. I I I really love working with forms and inventing them. And uh, in the last several poems I've written, I've been working on syllabics and um, uh, just controlling the line length that way. I've been writing nine syllable lines as a way of not writing iambic pentameter. It looks kind of like iambic <laughs> pentameter, but it's not. And, um, and I just enjoy fitting thoughts into words with a guidance of something that's not rational or yeah not rational we have a really interesting question from lynn mcgee um for both of you if the writer you are now could say something to the writer you were as a young woman what would you say um, let's see, I I'll guess I'll go first. Um, I think the writer I am now would tell the writer, my young woman version of me, um, I think that she is proud of me for sort of speaking my truth. Um, Cause some of my work does talk about how there was this, you know, sort of big aura of secrecy when I was growing up and um, particularly growing up in a black Southern family where it was kind of like, you know, you do not air your dirty laundry, you know, whatever that meant, right? For, you know, telling your childhood stories that were supposed to you know, be kept silent. So I think that, and, and so I definitely grew up with that, right? Um, that message was, you know, kind of sent to me. So the fact that the, you know, sort of more mature me is like, you know what, F it, you know, I'm, I'm gonna sort of tell those stories. And by telling those stories, I realized there's so many people who can relate, right? You know, which, which is what I've sort of realized with, when, my, when my book came out, having those conversations. Um, so I think that the, um, the, the me now would say that she was proud of the younger me for, you know, kind of stepping into her truth and being able to speak about those experiences um, and share them with other people. And that grateful that poetry has allowed me to, to do that, to be able to kind of speak honestly about those experiences. I, I think I would tell my younger self to just trust the direction my life is taking and uh, not worry about whether it's going to lead me in a direction that's going to lead me to new poems or experiences that will be turned into poems, but just to, to receive the life I've been given and be grateful for it and find the truths that are, are waiting to be discovered in what has been handed to me instead of trying to control it. Thank you both for, for answering that. that. That was a great question too, Lynn. Um, 
JP, I was wondering when you when you briefly talked about um, the secret family secret poem, you mentioned Toy Derricotte and and thanked her um, for that poem. It was was it something particular of hers that you read or was it a class that she taught? Yeah, it was a class that she had taught at Cave Canem, you know, um, one summer when I was a, you know, fellow, the fellows, you go three summers in a row. So, you know, studied with her all three summers. Um, and she had said, uh, and actually I wrote it for another class, um, Ed Roberson's class, but she was the one who sort of gave the assignment the night before. And she said, you know, tomorrow think about writing that, you know, that difficult poem, that family secret. Yeah. I think that was actually a term that she used, you know, and that was the first time that I had written about my mom's attempted suicide um, and shared it with other people, you know, uh, and, and then when the book got accepted, I really sort of was thinking about, do, do I even want that included, you know, so I really sort of struggled with that as well. You wow. Know? Um, whether or not I was going to include that, because um, you know, my mom was you know, alive at the time and, you know, how, how was she going to you know, sort of take that? Um, but ultimately, obviously, I, ch I chose to include it, and I'm, and I'm glad it did. It's led to a lot of, you know, important conversations, um, you know, with and without my, with you know, inside and outside of my family. Mm. Yeah, it's a really yeah. powerful poem. Thank and you. Thank you for thank reading you. it. Thank you. I've read it very I... few times, you know, but yeah. yeah. Thank you. And then definitely a lot of repetition in that poem, you know, as an example of sort of repetition, you know. And I remember I workshopped it in Ed, Rob Ed Roberson's class, um, and it was really good to sort of get his feedback as well on that and sort of the power of the repetition and, and some you know suggested edits that he gave me that, that did go into the book. And Marilyn, can you tell us one more time the name of the poem that you, if you remember it off the top of your head, that you were reading when, when we had the computer glitch so everyone can read it on their own <laughs> separately after? Yeah, it's called the Tulsa Convulsion. It was published some, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's online. Okay. I don't remember where it was published now. But we can even look, um, yeah, we can even look it up and put the link in for people because I don't want anyone to have missed any of that poem. Um, and of course this is recorded, so, um, but not the part where we were all kicked off. No, we all got kicked out. <laughs> And I was like, what happened? We were all like, what happened? I thought I did something. Then I thought it was my son. I said, did you do something? Because he's, you know, he's, in school. he's constantly in school. Some, you know, I was about to go and say, did you do something to mommy's computer? <laughs> yeah, we were all blaming someone else. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now I feel bad for me thinking that, you know? <laughs> so let's see um, if there are other questions. Sophia, do you, do you see another question for, for Marilyn and, and JP in the chat. Most of it is praise, which again, <laughs> we're gonna send you all um, afterwards so you can make sure to, to see what everyone's saying about your poems. Yes, the, the chat box is just flooding with praise right now. Um, I've got another process-based question for Marilyn. Um, so much of your work is autobiographical, but also it's historical. It's combined, it's, you know, finding the truth that's both personal and collective. Um, and I'm wondering if you keep a personal journal, um, also if you take research notes and if those things are, you know, in the same notebook, um, just how you how you make those connections on the page. I used to, to keep a journal, I don't anymore. Um, I do take research notes. And um, I, mean, I have to because I don't have such a great memory um, any longer. Um, and because research notes are useful, uh, even if you don't turn them into anything, doing research is, is so rewarding. Uh, fine, I, mean, I, I particularly like doing historical research, but uh, uh, um, reading about science is also really interesting. And um, so, yes, I keep pretty copious notes. I did a, a, a young adult book about uh, an all girl swing band that toured the United States during the Second World War and um, was a swing band. And I, my brother who was a musician convinced me that I should write in the voices of the instruments. 
So I had to learn how the instruments are played, uh, what their range is, what kind of personalities they have. And then I also had to, to learn the history of the band I was writing about, who the women were in the band, where they, where they traveled, um, what music they played. And, and I had a lot of different notebooks. Some of them, one of the notebooks was about the instruments and interview notes from interviews of musicians who played the clarinet. And one of them was about notes about the women in the band. And one of them was a timeline of things that were going on during the war and then I had to juggle all of these things during the writing and um, and it was it was really crazy um, but it was it was a great pleasure to to write that the book I don't know if the book may be out of print by now it's called Sweethearts of Rhythm I'm pretty sure it's out of print that's illustrated by Jerry Pinckney who is one of the most masterful illustrators at all in the country, children's book illustrators, and certainly one of the most masterful African-American children's books uh, illustrators. So uh, yeah, it was great fun to work on it. Well, thank you so much for that really thorough answer. Um, I'd like to extend a very similar question to JP so much of your work is so deeply autobiographical. And um, I'm wondering, especially when you're working with memories that are maybe further in the past than others, are you working from notes from a journal? Are you working with memories that might have changed over time? What's your process like? Um, I'm really a big believer in using archival materials, particularly family archival materials, memorabilia, and uh, actually in a lot of my workshops is sort of what I talk about and encourage folks to do. So of course my mom was a model, so I have these like hundreds of vintage black and white photos um, that I have. Um, I've also used journals. I found some old journals of hers, you know, they have these little, you know, sort of little small entries. And I, I love the Zoe Hitsu form, so sometimes I'll use that. Um, that's like a great form that you can use so many different things, right? You can use journals. Sometimes I'll use family recipes, an old family recipe of my grandmother, kind of like, you know, put that in the palm. It's really almost like a melting pot of all these different, you know, great things. Um, and it does help also because sometimes, sometimes I am writing about difficult or those hard topics. So sort of having that, um, these other external, you know, family uh, memorabilia or archival material helps me. Um, but I'm definitely a, someone who really encourages folks to, to use all of those kind of materials. And it can be your own materials or it can be historical materials. A lot of the stuff that, you know, Marilyn's talking about that you can also kind of, you know, bring, bring it to your poetry. Um, but for me, definitely using the, the family mem memorabilia, including, you know, including photos, including recipes, um, including journals or diary entries, so many different things. Even now, more modern, we can use, you know, sometimes I, I will encourage folks to use bits and pieces of emails you know, many times we save these old email uh, between between different people who may not may no longer be a part of your lives. Those are things you can also bring in. Um, so I'm definitely a big um, advocate of using archival materials in in poetry, and particularly if you're dealing with certain topics, I think sometimes that helps helps do that, helps you get into those those topics and dig a little bit deeper. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, we we have another question in the chat. Uh, for both of you. Can you talk about juggling your creative life of writing and your professional life of teaching or speaking at readings or working on community projects? <laughs> Do you want to go first, Marilyn? <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, uh, it's crazy. What, what, what is possible to say? Just there were years when uh, I had to get the kids to bed and then sit at my desk and do paper grading and class preparation for the next day and committee work for the department and get to the end of that and then it would be maybe one or two o'clock in the morning and I was 
able to take maybe an hour to work on what I thought was my real work that all of the other stuff I was doing was forgettable. I mean, I had students who, if I ran into them at the mall a month after the end of the semester, they didn't even recognize me. Why was I spending all my time worrying about what I was teaching them? They didn't even know who I was. But I knew that the poems I was writing were the repositories of the real life I was given. You no, know, I was given a life to be a poet. And, uh, or, you know, years when I was getting up at five in the morning to write before uh, family life started. It's hard. It's hard to, to have two or even three, um, what do I want to call them? Uh, responsibilities which are important that you want to give your life to. And uh, I spend a lot of time apologizing or feeling I should apologize to my son who was my older child because I felt I had stolen a lot of time from him because I I was just driven to write. Um, and he keeps, every time I've apologized, he said, oh no, you were a great mom. Oh, stop no. apologizing. But I remember times when I said, leave me alone, <laughs> I'm trying to write. Um, but he doesn't, luckily doesn't remember those things. JP, where are you? Help me I'm out. here, I'm here. <laughs> was, I know. It's always good to listen to you, you know, sort of hear your experience. Um, yes, no, it's a lot to juggle, you know, I'm a mom and a son in high school. So definitely, you know, it's a busy time now as we're thinking about colleges and all that. And um, also work like a nine to five job, even before the new jobs I'm starting next week. <laughs> um, and I curate, you know, my uh, poetry salon, which brings me a lot of joy, though, even though it's, you know, sort of busy. Um, sometimes a lot of the things that I do also bring me a lot of joy, you know, especially now during this pandemic moving everything online, you know, but it's definitely a lot of, a lot to balance. I recently um, wrote an essay about sort of my writing history, my, my writing life, you know, because sort of where, I, where the trajectory um, it has sort of taken, you know, as, as a poet and kind of what brought me to the place that I am today. Um, and I do talk about a lot about that, you know, balancing, um, particularly, you know, kind of having a wife and kids and, and everyone, not always, I don't want to say not necessarily respecting, you know, my, um, myself as a poet, you know, it's kind of like, uh, but sometimes that has, you know, that has happened as well, you know, um, because I do have this whole other life also, you know, sort of as this public interest lawyer that I've been as well. Um, so that has been kind of that, that struggle for, um, people, uh, maybe in, in all aspects of my life to respect the fact that yes, I am a, I mean, I'm a poet, I'm a writer, I'm just very sort of creative person. Um, but I guess it depends on what form people, you know, meet me in, right? Um, so yes, yeah, so it's definitely a lot of, you know, balancing that, that goes, goes into that, um, into being a mom and wife and working full time and being a writer. Uh, but ultimately it's, it's the thing that I'm most passionate about is, is definitely, you know, the writing and the creative part of my life. And so I don't, it wouldn't be me if I, if I wasn't able to do that, right? So that's also the thing, you know, that's, that keeps me going. <laughs> Thank you a both. Fine poem by Yates called The Choice, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, essentially about choosing between the life and the work. Yeah. And um, it, it, it's a male point of view, but it's true for everybody who has to deal with that struggle to balance yes. things yeah that's right yeah and always you know i'm never quite say it's a you know a balance that i've worked out yeah i'm always kind of trying to do better with it you know um, when people say have you reached that perfect balance absolutely not <laughs> always trying always trying to do a little bit better with it you know <laughs> um well i think we have time for one more question we have a lot of um emerging poets in the audience, um, people working on their first book and their first chapbook. And so maybe if each of you could just 
comment a little bit about putting together a first collection, especially since we have two perspectives, one from uh, someone who's you know recently put together a first book and then Marilyn who put together a first book a while ago, um, but has you know the insights of uh, many years of putting books together. If you could just um, give some advice, some salient tips to the emerging poets in the audience, they would be very grateful. Um, I think maybe JP should uh... go first. Okay. Yeah. I mean, my not as much experience as, <laughs> as uh, you know, Marilyn. Um, uh, but advice. Um, let's see. Definitely, it's a, it's for me. It's helped having kind of a writing community. So um, being a part of like various you know fellowships um, like Cave Con and Bona. So having these places where I can kind of workshop the poems that ultimately you know kind of went into my my initial first collection and will be going into some of the, in, into the new collection that I'm finishing up now. Uh, so for me, I think that's really, has been really important is sort of finding a, a community because you do want to get feedback on that work, right? That you, sometimes we're sort of so isolated um, and we can be hard on ourselves. I know I could be really hard on myself, you know? So having um, trusted, and even if it's just one other person, a trusted writer who can kind of review, um, whether not necessarily an editor, but someone who can review and be honest and give you that, you know, feedback. Um, if you're not in these other communities, for me, community is a big part, right, of my writing. So for that, that's something that was important to me, um, meeting people through these various, you know, fellowships or writing retreats and, and getting feedback that way. But however you get it, even if it's just, you know, um, an individual person that you trust who, you know, who has more experience, um, definitely do that when you're sort of gathering your work, gathering your work together. Don't just send it out, you know, <laughs> you definitely want to make sure that you, you uh, have someone that you trust to look it over. Oh, for, for, for me, my first book, um, I had stopped writing for about 10 years. And when I started writing again, I sent the first finished poem to a poet I had uh, had as a professor in graduate school and my sending him this poem began a conversation through the mail in which uh, I would send him po a poem and he would write a comment about it and say send me something else and after about a year of this exchange he said he thought I was ready for a book and that I should put a manuscript together. And I just put together the poems I had and sent them to him. And he sent them out to some editors he knew. So it was completely out of my hands. And most of my books since then have been projects. Um, picking up some kind of story to tell and just telling it. And most of my manuscripts have been edited by my best friend, Pamela Espeland, who is a professional editor. And she's just really brilliant and willing to do this work for nothing. Um, and um, so I, I haven't, ha I honestly ha haven't had to deal with that laying poems around the floor of the bedroom. Pamela and I did that one year when we were together at AWP. She told me to bring all of my poems and we laid them all out in the hotel room we were sharing and decided together how to organize uh, a book. But for, for the most part, they're just stories. I mean, I tell the story of Venture Smith or I tell the story of, of um, um, well, let's see, Prudence Crandall. 
and the, they all they fit together because they're historical and they're telling a story that has a beginning middle and end so i'm not i'm, I'm not a confessional poet i don't for the most part write about my own life the book i've written about my own life takes place in the in the 50s and so it begins in 1950 and ends in 1960. All right. not too much thinking has to go into that so i'm i've been i've been lucky not to have to deal with my own writing the way so many uh especially younger poets i think um feel they have to so. Great, thank you both so much for being here tonight. And thank you to the audience, you're a great audience. And thank you for all coming, jumping back onto the link when we had our, our computer um, glitch with Zoom. But we are still grateful to the technology of Zoom, even though maybe JP can write a praise poem for <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Zoom. That's right. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, because really, we would we would be so alone and so isolated during this pandemic if we didn't have this. I mean, my students and I talk about it all the time. How grateful we are that we can still be together during this time. And these readings have been really fantastic. And we've reached out to so many people from all over the country. And we hope that even after the pandemic is over. Um, you will still continue to, to come zoom into us when we are back at the Hudson Valley Writers Center in Sleepy Hollow, and we'll still have you all um, come when you can to hear our great poets and, and novelists for our reading series. And please come back to hear Marion Brown introduce Roger Reeves and Jeffrey Yang and Alicia Orsticker on the 24th of February, uh, seven o'clock. Um, and stay in touch with us. Um, and Marilyn and JP, again, thank you so much. And we're going to send you, you the, um, the chat. We're going to save it and send it to you. And please don't forget to purchase the books. Um, please support the, the writers and the small presses who are bringing such great work out to you. Now more than ever, it's important to, to support these presses. And thank you all for your support of the center and um, looking forward to, to March 14th. We have um, Aaron, our new chapbook winner, who's always in the audience. Here he is, he's hey. waving and he'll be launching his mm -hmm. brand new beautiful SHP chapbook on the 14th of March. So please come back so you can hear Aaron and Liz, our last year winner, Liz Marlowe is in the audience today too. So. Um, I hope we see you all back then. Thank you all so much and have a really good night. Please stay safe, get vaccinated when you can, and we'll see you all soon. <laughs>